you ever been as a young person, maybe even an adult, you, uh, you go to the dinner table, or the lunch table, even the breakfast table, and, and you get served something maybe you've never tried before, something you've had quite often, uh, something that looks maybe even strange and you don't know why you got it, but you know that it's good for you and your mom, your dad says, just eat what's put before you. It's good for you. Especially when it uh, came to um, Buckley's mixture. You knew it was good for you. Yeah, yeah. And then, you ever had your parents say, back in the days when you used to get spanked, and they'd say, it's going to hurt me a whole lot more than you? Well, I'd like to have traded the places there then. But anyhow, tonight, we're under the banner of restoration, restoring ourselves to our place in God. Again, what do we do? We stir up a revival. Revival is not necessarily always people coming into the church. Revival starts in yourself, where the Bible talks about where the rivers of living water begin to flow. So we serve for revival in our souls. Now, under the banner of restoration, this series of studies is intended to help us make, to make us more than conquerors in Christ. Restoration is to restore us, to heal us, to revive us, so we can become the church and the people that God means for us to be. That's what it's all about. Now, this has been a while. You've heard that little intro in just kind of different ways over the last several weeks. But think about what you need to do. This is kind of food. Well, some of the food I, I like. I have parts of the food I didn't like. Maybe be like me as a little, uh, as a young man. What I would do is I'd pour ketchup on everything. Cream, corn, you name it. Peas and carrots. Didn't matter. And when my mother served my favorite meal, liver... I sat there until it got cold and I took a half a bottle of Heinz ketchup, poured on it and cried the whole time I had to eat it, waiting for her to turn around so I could spit it on the floor to uh, discard it. Anyhow, let's stand together. We must not digress. We want to be restored. Ready? Turn with me, please, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. Remember the announcements because if you forget them, I'm going to remind you. All right, as we stand, let's go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, and we're going to begin our reading this afternoon at verse number 5. Proverbs, chapter 3, verse number 5, what does it say? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Paths, pardon me. And be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with all thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Jesus, we thank you tonight for this study. I'm asking God that your word does go forth. You don't let it return, boy. We need to swallow it. Sometimes we need to just... Survey it, receive it, we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. God bless you, maybe see it again. <clears throat> now I know that we're seasoned. Wednesday nights have been for uh, the assembly, but you just wait, hang on, keep your seatbelt on, see where we go. I want to preach to you a message titled, The Hardest Thing You Will Ever Do. The Hardest Thing you will ever do. The American Heritage Dictionary defines the word trust as being, number one, to have or to place confidence in or to depend upon. Number two, to expect with assurance or to assume. Number three, to believe. And finally, to place in the care of another or to entrust. The phrase, trust in the Lord, in Proverbs 3 and 5, as we read, is a phrase that appears in the scripture 19 times in 19 verses. Obviously, it's important. Obviously, right. trusting in the Lord means something. So, as we begin tonight, let me say how that trust is a foreign concept to our generation. Today's culture is not a trusting one. You say, well, why is that, Pastor? I'll tell you why. Because for the past several years, pretty much everything that people used to trust in has failed them. 
Give that a thought for a second. Everything we put our trust in fails us. Some 40 to 50 years ago, and I know many of you are young for this one, deals were set upon none other than a handshake. That's right. They sold land, they bought houses, they, they traded goods, products. They said, when you know the harvest comes, I'll give you money for this now, or I'll help you with this now, and you'll pay at that time. Is that okay? And you shake a hand, and that was as good as it got. In our world today, legal documents all but need to be signed in blood. <laughs> And they're produced in triplicate. Now, why is that? Well, if for no other reason, than because I don't trust you. That's why. Oh, no. I want it notarized. I want it legalized. I want it proof. I want the blood sample and the firstborn. I want to make sure you're going to do, you're going to do your part of the deal. I don't trust you. Yeah. People today are being taught not to trust any institution, the government, the education system, religion, as well as what it is that we read in the newspaper. Don't trust that or what we hear on the radio, what some see on the television and pretty much every social media outlet. Don't trust them. And of course, we're also taught not to trust other people. We moved here uh, this October. It's going to be 24 years, 24 years ago. And we came here, my wife of course, everybody knows as a daycare parent. Well, we came into a closed community that closed down on Fridays at 6 and every other day at 5. You can go to the hospital, you can go to the police station, you can go to the bar, you can go to 7-Eleven, everything else was closed. And so were the people. It wasn't easy to let them have your children into your home. I don't know you. I don't know nothing about you. And, and so people are taught not to trust today. Now, the sad reality is mistrust is something that has become a part of our current generation. Watch her. Watch him. I don't trust them. Mm -hmm. You don't know them. People always figure, you know, you've got an ulterior motive. There's something under the covers that you're trying to hide, and, and suddenly you're going to just burst out and, and throw something at them. And so what they do is they, they enter with caution. They check out you and and try to figure you out. Why? Because they're so filled with mistrust. And again, you could say, well, why would that be? Well, I'll tell you why. Because our present culture has allowed its mistrust to go from people and institutions to adversely affecting people's trust in God. That's right. Which in turn affects their relationship with God. You ever, you ever been invited up to an altar before? You can stay in your seat and just lift up your hand and be an honest Pentecostal. No, I don't have honest Pentecostals here today. Okay, fine. So, invited to the altar. You know what you do? You hang on. And you ain't moving anywhere. I am in my comfort zone. I'm not moving. Why? What will God do? How will I behave? What will happen if I step out and do that? Trust in God. I'm going to take that a whole lot further. So that's why learning to trust God is one of the hardest things you in your life will ever do. And let me expound. The story was told many years ago about a man who fell over the side of a 500-foot cliff. He caught a hold of a small sapling growing out of a rock and he held on for dear life as a man shouted over and over again help me help me can anyone hear me someone help me after a while as he began to lose his grip on that sapling and he started he started even now to pray oh god please help me i need a miracle as the story goes the man heard an audible voice the audible voice of god saying do you trust me the man holding on for dear life said, Yes, Lord, I trust you. I need your help. To which the Lord required, replied, pardon me, Okay, then let go. The man asked the Lord again, What did you just say, God? And the Lord repeated what he had said again. I said, Let go of the sapling. As the man thought for a moment, he began to shout, oh, Is there anybody else out there who can help me? I trust you. Remember playing that game, you know, back to, or they would turn their back on you, put your hands like this. I don't know, you guys aren't with me today, that's fine. Uh, and, and you would, the other person would stand behind you, I'll catch you. 
You know, my brother played that game with me and I hit the floor many a times because I played that game again and again. I'll trust you. And then I used to play it like this, you know. You ever, I know you, you always keep your eyes closed. No, I trust you. Is there anybody else that can help me? The moral of the story is it's easy for one, someone to say that they trust God. But what about those times when the cupboards are as empty as your bank account? Mm -hmm. What about those times when even the necessities of life are what you need and according to the word of God, you're supposed to be faithful in your giving of 10% of your gross income to God. And at times, if you were to do so, it would be the very necessities of life you then would not, not be able to afford. That is, unless you obey the word of God and instead you trust him. One man said one time, I can't afford to tithe. And the other man replied, you can't afford not to. What about that time I put $10 in that offering and I know that's my last 10 bucks. I know that I needed milk and bread and maybe some peanut butter and jam for the morning. Well, you can't do that now with $10. We'll have to raise it to 30 And you won't tithe. Mm -hmm. See my face? <clears throat> Let him pay. Let her pay. Well, how about those times when it's God who chooses to delay his answering what you believe to be an earnest prayer? It is in such times as these that a message such as this is what has the ability to try your very resolve in the fact of whether or not you truly can testify to the fact you do trust God. Seasoned saints, you do trust God. Oh, yes, you do. Well, do you? Okay, let's carry on. James Dobson one said, faith in God is like believing a man can walk over Niagara Falls on a tightrope while pushing a wheelbarrow. That's faith. Trusting in God is like getting you into the wheelbarrow. <laughs> and then believing that God can do the miraculous. Yes, he can. Well, that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is the risk in your willingness to believe that as you do step out in faith and trust God that he as God will be the one to bring the miraculous into your life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You know what I'm saying, church. It's like you're trusting God when you can't see the outcome. Come on. Mm -hmm. You ever walk around, do this sometime, even at home. Shut all the lights off, close your eyes and start walking around. You're going to do everything you can to remember where this was and that was. And we'll do the same thing with God. I'm just going to trust you. I don't know what's going to happen. I just know that I trust you. Amen. It's like you're trusting in God when you don't know which way to go. Mm -hmm. What do I do? How do I respond to this? And again, it's like trusting in God to where you and your heart believe that all things will work out for good when you do. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to believe that God's going to bless me for that. Another of life's circumstances comes when you choose to trust in God, even though from all appearances, catch this now please, it looks like any hope of anything good coming out of your circumstance is non-existent. Mm -hmm. Blind faith. Mm -hmm. Just step out. Trust me. It doesn't look good. Do you trust me? Is there anybody out there else that can help me? <laughs> Let go of the sapling. See, that's why in the above times that I've just shared with you are some of the most difficult times. And they bring with them difficult decisions that you in your life must choose. What are you going to do? That's up to you. What am I going to do? That's up to me. Well, you've got to choose. You must choose to make it. Make what? The decision and that choice. As, <clears throat> as it is you who is the one who is faced with the hardest thing that you'll ever do. You don't believe me? Wait till those times come into your life. Wait till that crossroad comes where you live and it's in your house and it has to do with mm -hmm. you. Come on. Mm -hmm. And that is both your choice and the decision that you must make to put your faith in God and your trust in none other 
and almighty God. I believe you. We sing this song, I believe God, I believe God, trust and obey. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, let's carry on. Listen to me, church. Trusting in God is harder than paying your tithes and believing that when you do, God will make a way for the other provisions of life that you need. Right. Isn't it? It's harder. Trusting in God is harder than being faithful in church attendance. Pardon me. Trusting in God is harder than living a holy and a separated life. It is. I can, I can just do this and, and just live that way, you know. Trusting in God is harder than forgiving someone who's done you wrong. Trusting in God is harder than having faith for miracles. Why? Why? Because trusting in God means you'll obey him and you'll do these things. Ready? Here we go. You'll trust God and you'll pay your tithes, as the Bible says. You'll trust God and be faithful in your church attendance. You'll trust God and live a holy and a separated life. You will trust God and forgive someone that's done you wrong. Mm -hmm. You'll trust God and you'll have faith for miracles. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, trusting God means that you believe that God's plan for your life is better than your own right. plan. Come on. Come on Have you heard the old saying in the world, this is, I'm not meaning to bring the world into the church here, but my way or the highway? <laughs> what did Jesus say in the garden? Not my will, but thy will be done. You see, his, I believe God's plan is better than my own. And trusting God, either way you want to look at it, makes you vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Write it down, honey. What I'm saying to you is, <clears throat> trust is the highest level of faith. The Bible speaks of what? No faith, little faith, a measure of faith. The Bible talks about a gift of faith, having strong faith, maybe great faith, and being full of faith. A man once wrote, faith grows only in the dark. You've got to learn to trust God even when you can't see him. Even when I don't see it, he's working here, yeah. You never stop, you never stop. <laughs> Did he take his coffee break? Why is he not listening to me tonight? Romans chapter 8, would you turn there with me tonight? I hope this is okay, I'm not boring you. If you eat it and restore, you'll learn, you'll grow, you'll become stronger, and God will bless you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and we know <laughs> that all things work together for the good to them who are the called it, to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we know, anybody know tonight, you know? I trust God. I, I know all things work together for the good, right? Let's go on that one. I remember one time in my life, it was very, very dark. Before we moved here and stuff, I lost my job. And I went home to my wife and she said, get an education, get a better job. You can find something better. I'm going, yeah, go get an education and pay the bills, the rent, the, uh, the mortgage, the visa, yeah, and all the bills we have. Yeah, sure, put clothes in our back, food in our cupboards. Get a, get a better education. I thought, you don't know what you are talking about. And so I went over and called pastor, met him at the church. And I said, Pastor Simmons, I said, they just let me go at my job, and I don't know what to do. You know what he said to me? He looked me in the eye just like this, and he said, go get an education and get a better job. And I said, Pastor, I said, education is not going to pay my bills. And I went through the whole thing, and he said, you've got to trust God. Am I talking to anybody tonight? Probably just myself. That's fine. Don't worry about it. So guess what I did? I went and applied through the employment uh, insurance used to be called unemployment insurance, but we've educated ourselves. Now it's employment insurance. And, and you know what they did? They paid for my upgrading of my education. And at the end of this, they also helped me to get some job experience. And I never lost one payment of my employment insurance, unemployment insurance. I got, I got paid every, every week or two weeks. I can't remember what it was back then. Oh, trusting God. <laughs> Okay, well, well, how about before, and I, I think I've shared this with you, but you're going to hear it again. Before moving to Williams Lake, <laughs> I, I had a promise. 
that <clears throat> of only six months of a job when I got here. I'm selling a house, we're closing a daycare, we're coming up here with the hope of either finding a house, putting a down payment, and when we got here, it didn't really look good. The boss told me, I can only promise you six months. I do have to confess, 24 years later, hopefully Pastor Simmons, if you ever listen to this, he'd forgive me. I didn't tell him I was only promised six months. I felt God wanted us to come to Williams Lake. Some of you might regret it, but that's still okay. Um, yeah, you do that. You just go ahead with only a short promise. You know what God did? A lady that wasn't very good at that time, I had no idea what was going on. It was different. It was an office. I was never here before. Um, she left and she said, I have a full-time position for you. When your, your probationary period ends, would you like to sign a contract? And I'm going, yeah, trusting in God. <laughs> you better believe I need a job. Amen. All right. Tonight, through this Bible study, all of us can take five powerful trust principles from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. What does it say? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Ready? Or you're sitting down. Principle number one, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Trust in the Lord Amen. with all that. You guys are really quiet tonight. Either I'm missing it and you're not getting it, or, or maybe it's just hitting so deep it's in under the fifth rib and you guys are feeling it and you just don't want to cry out in pain. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Trust is a heart matter. Hmm. When you walk down the aisle and you say to that uh, spouse of yours, you him or her, you say, <clears throat> until death do me do us part, I love you and... Da, 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 da. When you get that job and you show up at 9 o'clock in the morning, you trust that that door is going to be open and that boss is going to hire you and in two weeks you're going to get paid. Don't tell me it's not a heart matter. You've got to believe it in here or you just wouldn't do it. A pastor named uh, E.V. Hill in Los Angeles, California, he preached the funeral of his beloved wife. He concluded his message with these words. What the Lord is saying is there's only... One message, trust me. Even when you don't understand and you can't comprehend the reason why, just trust me. Amen. The heart is the seat of our emotion and the, ha and the habitat of our affections. The message is trusting in the Lord with all your emotions, your desires, your affections, as well as with all your needs. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> it's a simple matter of the heart, you know, but it's easier for you. <laughs> it's, e it's, pardon me, it's going to be easier for you to either you'll choose to trust in God or sadly you won't. Do you trust me? You either, either do one or two. It's going to be easy for you to say yes or I'm going to tell you no. Sometimes our problem is that we make our emotions our God. Mm -hmm. Amen, Pastor. Thank you very much. That was good sound wisdom. And we make the sacrifice and sacrifices at the altar of pleasure and self rather than sacrificing our will at the foot of a cross. <laughs> not me. Ain't happening. I'm not doing that. Do you trust me? Mm -hmm. Then we allow fear and despair to control our minds. Thank you again, Pastor. That's great. I really like that. Amen. Double shot. Rather than allowing our trust in God and His Word to be what guides our thinking and allows us to rest under the shadow of God's love. Amen. Right. He's not going to hurt me. Right. He doesn't have an ulterior motive. God's not up there to get me. He's not there to stick me in the back. Or he loves me. I'm going to hide under the shadow of His wings. I'm going to trust Him. 
Jesus said one time, how often would a hand gather her chicks under her brood, but you wouldn't. Why don't you trust me? I want to protect you from the storm. I want to shield you from your trial. I want to let you know that when there's footprints in the sand and you only see one, I'm walking with you. I want you to know in the darkest valley and the highest mountain, I'm going to be there. Do you not trust me? See, the truth is, worry is a whole lot easier than trust. The truth is, worry is a whole lot easier than trust. Want to see my worn out shoes, especially when I was young? <laughs> yep. What are we gonna do? What's gonna happen? I don't know. How are we gonna get? Who's gonna pay? And how are we gonna? Who's gonna? Where's the food? Oh, I'm gonna pay my rent. How are we gonna? Oh, oh, I don't know. How am I gonna get to work? The car broke. Down. Oh, what are we? Gone. You got me that job not to lose it. You didn't build your house for me to move away. You didn't teach me to swim to let me drown. You didn't build your house for me to move away. Trust in God. Amen. So to carry worry to bed is like trying to sleep with a backpack on your back. Meaning. You can never get comfortable. Why? Well, because the weight of your worry and stress never allows you to get that rest. That's why. We owe a million dollars to do tomorrow. Hello, is this Mr. Johnson of the First National Bank? Yes, it is. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, I know. My husband, Mr. Johnson, owes you a million bucks. It's due tomorrow. We don't have the money! Now shut up. Roll over and go to sleep. Let him worry about it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Trust in God. Another man once said, worry is present. Trust cannot crowd, or when worry, pardon me, is present, trust cannot crowd its way in. How are you going to get trust in there when you do, you, you're just flustered and, and just messed up and just, oh, you're out of sorts, you're not thinking straight. So when worry is present, trust cannot crowd its way in. Shakespeare himself understood the principle of trust when he wrote this. Where worry lodges, sleep will never lie. Mm -hmm. And an old English proverb says, work won't kill you, but worry will. That's right. Anxiety, ulcers, struggles, problems, hair loss, sleep loss. Work won't kill you. Worry will. An old Jewish proverb says it this way, worms eat you when you're dead, worry eats you when you're alive. I'm talking to you. Yeah. Season saint. Proverbs chapter 30. Just after Psalm. It's good to bring your Bible to church. That's why we read your Bible. We bring it to church. I know it goes up there, but that's a lazy man's way. If we weren't online, I'd shut it off faster than I turned it on. So Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 5. Are you ready? <laughs> Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Yeah. Every word of God is pure. How about Luke chapter 10? Luke chapter 10. In verse number 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Do you trust me? <coughs> That's God speaking, by the way, not me. Principle number two, here we go. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Forget what you think you know. Come on. Mm -hmm. I know better. I know how to do that. Forget that. Don't lean to your own understanding. A man named, uh, his name was James Koch. He once said, faith is the capacity to trust God while not being able to make sense out of everything. Mm -hmm. How's it going to work out? I don't know. What are we going to do? I... <clears throat> I married a, my wife 41 years ago and when we were first living for God and broke, no food, no money, nothing. And I was hungry. You heard the story, three days. I was starving, really, feeling sorry for myself, pity party and 
Mr. Worry Word. What are we going to do? And she looked at me in the face and she said, why don't we pray? Oh, yes. I'll give it to you. And manna will come raining down from on high and it'll drop in our place, honey, and we'll gather it like the Jews did back you know, on the way out of Egypt and on the way to the promised land. And yes, and maybe we'll go out and smite a rock. Are we going to pray? Are you going to pout? I was growing up at 22, let me tell you. I said, fine. I don't, none of you got this attitude that's just me. Fine. And I told God I was hungry, starving to death, wanted food. Yeah, the sister next door, well, she was making spaghetti. I could smell it. You ever lick the paint on your side of the wall before, hoping that you get a taste of the spaghetti on the other side? I was ready to. We prayed. Not even five minutes later. Knock on the door. There she stood. You know the story. There she was with a plate of spaghetti. Oh, we had some extra. I just thought you and your wife might like some. Well, you know. I guess we can take it. I got big shoulders. Swallow your pride, jerk. Oh, I was talking to myself there. Um, and I took that. Have you ever carried, uh, heard about people carrying nitroglycerin? I took that spaghetti like it was gold. And, and I moved it to the table. But when I went, when I closed that door on the other side of that door, there was this beautiful young woman looking me in the eye and going, And she pointed up in the sky, and I thought, shut up and let's have some spaghetti. <laughs> let's eat. Do you trust me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't lean onto your own understanding. See, what you do is you lean. <laughs> what do you lean on? Pardon me. When life becomes stressful, what do, you, what do you lean on? What do you lean on? Ready? Many people lean on their emotions for the moment. Emotions cause them to react in ways that are far from God's ways. Right. I'll steal it, get it. I'll... We were so poor we couldn't afford the church mice. Going in the dish and getting pop bottles so you can get a slush, you are desperate. Digging out of a garbage can at a place called Humble Valley for your food when you ain't got no food, that's desperation. But God provides. When you don't mean to your own understanding. Proverbs chapter 12. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12 verse number 15. <clears throat> the Bible says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Pastor what should I do? God what do you want me to do? Proverbs 14 and verse number 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof, or end thereof, pardon me, are ways of death. I know what's right. I know what I should do. I shouldn't have done that, should I? See, it's been said that our minds are a, are a complex and are often our own worst enemy. When I start thinking, that's my worst enemy. When I, I start thinking instead of trusting, that's... And it is our brains that deceive us into thinking something is right when it is really wrong. For example, life experiences, good and bad, can change your thinking. And your thinking will change who and what you put your trust in. Life experiences. Could be good, could be bad. Well, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe that's just wrong. See, that's why it can be so hard to trust God. And on the other hand, that is why it's so important that we do trust in God. Amen. How do you trust God? Come on, lay it out there for us. Well, you're choosing to trust Him. Well, that was revolutionary. That was prophetic. For trusting God is a choice of a commitment and action rather than an act. Right. Oh, I can trust Him. All right, everything goes south first thing in the morning, and you are in trouble. What did Pastor say last night? <laughs> yeah, tell yourself. <laughs> okay, fine. 
Let's look at Psalms chapter 37. Psalms chapter 37, verse number 23. The Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Whose way? God's way, his way, whose way, God's way. And when you do trust God to guide your steps, you will quit criticizing the method and you begin to envy the results. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. Okay, you know the song. See, you can trust God for great things because only God has the power to take something as small as five loaves and two fishes and turn around and feed 5,000 people. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All this being said, I, <laughs> I'd rather walk with God in the dark and just trust God for the outcome rather than walk alone in the light. Mm -hmm. Principle number three. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. How many ways? All of them. Put God first. Matthew chapter 6. Let's go there quickly. Matthew chapter 6. And verse number 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? All of them. What that verse is saying is that in every area of your life, put God first. Put him first. First in your finances, first in your family, first in your marriage, first in your spiritual life. And be the one to learn to put God first in concerns to your emotions. Are you ready? Feelings and emotions lie to you. Hebrews 1 tells us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. I'm not going to set my life on an emotional roller coaster. Instead, I'm going to set my soul upon trusting God. Amen. Here's your emotions, and here's God. See, if it was you who learned to acknowledge God in every area of your life, then it would be God who, as you trust Him, who would direct the paths of your, paths, pardon me, of your life, the ones that you take. And it would be God who would also control the outcome. That's right. They trusted me. Go wash at the pool. Go show yourself to the priest. Amen. James, let's go to the book of James chapter 4. Trust me. James chapter 4, beginning at verse number 13. Here we go. Go to now, ye that say to thee tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this. Or that. Right. So when you put the Lord in the forefront of your planning and acknowledge Him in all your ways, what you are doing is you're putting your trust into action. Amen. See, for it's not enough for you to say you trust God. You need to show that you trust God by your ways as referred to in Proverbs 3 and 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You see, when you're not thinking right, trust God. And turn your thoughts to the mind of Christ. When you feel like you're not valuable to anyone, trust God. And remember, God says you are the apple of his eye. When you feel like your life is going nowhere, trust God and remember that God says to you in the book of Jeremiah 29.11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. When you feel like no one cares, trust God. And start singing that old gospel song. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. When you feel like you have no hope, 
Trust God. And remember, God has never failed. In fact, God can never fail. He can't fail. Mm -hmm. When you feel like no one is standing with you, trust God. And again, remember, if God be for me, then who can be against me? Amen. Mm -hmm. When you feel all alone, trust God. And remember, God is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And nor will he, as God, ever leave you or will he ever forsake you. Right. We forsake him. He'll never forsake us. When it feels like the enemy is coming in like a flood, well, trust God and let God fight your battles and bring your enemies down. Mm -hmm. You can't do it by yourself. You've heard me use this analogy quickly. Where is he? Who are you talking about? Where's the other? I'm ready, man. I've had enough. When you find him, let me know. Oh, there he is. There he is. There he is. All right. Principle number four. Number four. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Don't be a wise guy. This portion of the scripture is very closely related to the principle number two. Lean not to thine own understanding. However, this verse of the scripture also reminds us to be humble before the Lord. Right. Why? Because not trusting in God often leads us to indulging in pride. Without even realizing it, you'll do it. For when you do not trust God, in effect, what you're saying is, I know better than God. Come on. Mm -hmm. You might argue that thought tonight and say, I'm not saying, <clears throat> I'm not saying that. Really? But in reality, when you trust yourself or others, even put your trust in position, money, and things before you trust God, in reality, you're implying those very words through your choices. Mm -hmm. For what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Think more, or pardon me, don't think more highly than you want. Oh, no. yeah. I've got a bank account, got a car, food and cupboards, place to live. You're fired. The bank closed. <clears throat> the landlord sold the house you're living in. Mm -hmm. You can't afford the mortgage or rent. Oh, yeah. Don't think more highly of yourself than you are. Proverbs chapter 16. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 16 and verse number 18. Are you listening? Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. An author and a speaker of the 19th century, his name was Oswald Chambers. He said this, the great stumbling block in the way of some people being disciples, followers, believers, Christians, is that they're gifted and yet so gifted that they won't trust God. I had one fellow tell me many years ago in the city of Kelowna, <clears throat> if I need God, I'll buy him. Principle number five. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Here's the acid test. Anybody know what an acid test is? If you don't, I'm going to help you to understand it. Victor Raymond Edmonds said about 200 years ago, to trust and obey God is the substance of the whole matter of living for God. You put it to a test. You put your trust. When you're up against the wall in a corner, don't know what to do, trust God. We'll find out whether you trust him or not. However, people, even you, often fear trusting God more than you fear not. Trusting God. Right. A healthy fear of the Lord, you know, demo, it denotes respect. By your looking up to God, by your having a healthy respect for God <clears throat> and not a fear that you can't trust God, what do you think He's going to do to you? Mm -hmm. If you have both of these, a healthy fear, and a respect for God, if you have both, a healthy fear and respect for God. In your life, the question is, why then do you fear to trust God? Because fear and faith, they don't mix. Mm -hmm. Oh, I trust him. What in the world? What are we going to do? Oh, my God. 
Did you pray? Yeah. Did you get prayed for? Yeah. I, I believe God. I believe God. Trust and obey. Oh, stop saying. And finally tonight. It's time for you to stop allowing your ways, your thoughts, and your emotions to control you. Mm-hmm. Yes, Pastor. And it's time for you to begin to trust God in every avenue of your life, or by doing so, it's you who, over time, will begin to learn to what? Number one, trust in the goodness of God. Number two, trust God enough to walk in the dimension of expectation. We do that when we come to church, tell you what, things would really change. What's God going to do? I can't wait to get there. Wow! I just want to know how the Holy Ghost is going to move tonight. Who's going to get the Holy Ghost? Trust God enough to walk in the dimension of expectation. Why? Knowing that He, as your God, has all of the answers. Number three, starting tonight, learn to speak out loud your trust in God, for when you do, you in turn will activate your faith. I believe God. I trust him. This is going to happen. Yes, sir. I know for a fact. Remember the London drugs job told you about? First male cashier ever stood there for about 45 minutes, waited for the manager, and he told me he had nothing for me. And seconds later, as I'm turning to walk away, I shook his hand. He said, do you have any cashier experience? I walked out to the vehicle with... uh, my first pastor, and he laughed at me. He said, what's happening? I said, I start Tuesday. Okay. Speak it out loud. God's going to do this. Yes, he will. I'm putting him to the test. Mm-hmm. What did Gideon do? Well, the fleece dry, <laughs> ground wet, fleece dry in the ground, or vice versa. Wet and dry, wet and dry. Really? Number four, just do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. Start tonight. As we stand together. It may be the hardest thing that you have ever done. Yeah, it might. I have been living for God for X number of years. Yeah, so have I. And if you walk some of the roads that I walked, (laughs) yeah, truth. But I stand here before you tonight to say to all of you that you can do it. Yes, you can. You can trust God. For with God, nothing is impossible. Would you you take a few minutes tonight? Would you pray with me? Would you say, God, have you brought this message because maybe I've been wavering in my faith and my trust? Help me to cross that threshold.